All right, um, I'm Dr. Tracy Robinson. Um, I had the good fortune to mentor these two gentlemen you're going to hear from up here. Uh, they are seniors in HPPE, graduating uh, in May, pretty soon. And um, I just found out that both of them will be pursuing graduate degrees in our department uh, starting in the fall. So we're really excited about that. Um, but they're going to, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time here because they've got a lot of things to tell you about. And so I'm not even going to read the title. You can all read that anyway. Um, enjoy it and ask lots of questions. Um, this is Jackson and um, this is David. Thanks. All right, so we looked at the nutri nutritional status and energy balance of a vegan athlete. Uh, those of you that haven't already cleared the, word, the room because of this word, uh, you're good to go. So uh, some, some good things to know before we get off and running with the presentation. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a vegan diet is, it's a diet that contains no animal products. So no eggs, milk, um, dairy products in general, uh, as well as meat. Uh, when you see this term, kcals, that, that means calories. So when you see on the back of a, on a food label where it says 45 calories, it's actually 45 kilocalories, it's just shorthand. Um, we'll refer to them as calories just to kind of keep things even keel. Uh, macronutrients and micronutrients. Macronutrients are your fats, your carbohydrates, your proteins, the things in our diet that contain calories and the things that get the most attention. Uh, micronutrients, on the other hand, are your vitamins and minerals, iron, magnesium, potassium, uh, vitamin A, C, E, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so what we did look at was energy balance. Uh, energy balance is the balance between the intake of the amount of calories uh, that you eat through food as well as um, a balance against the output of your calories through work. Uh, now your calorie burn is made up of three things we refer to it as your total daily energy expenditure. Uh, the first thing is TEF, that stands for thermic effective food. So when you uh, eat your food and you digest it and assimilate it into your body, 10% of the calories that you eat are used to do that. Uh, that is added with the thermic effective activity. This is the most popular one that we all know about, going out for a jog or run, sitting up, standing down, moving around. Uh, and then we add that with the RMR, which stands for resting metabolic rate. This is the amount of calories that you burn if you were to sit around and not move all day. It's the amount that you need to stay alive. Um, so when we talk about energy balance, that's what that means. And this was a three-day investigation, which means all calorie and nutrient intake was tracked for three days. And every activity that I could think of was tracked for three days. Uh, so we tracked... Uh, total calorie intake and nutrient intake through the USDA Super Tracker and My Food Record, which is an independent website. And we tracked my activity, activity and calorie burn through the Compendium of Physical Activities, both cited in references. All right, so we did our uh, three day food analysis on Jackson Espeset. Uh He's approximately 5'10, weighs 145 pounds. He has a 3.32% body fat, and he is a member of the cross country and track teams here at Adams State. Uh, at the time of this case study, he was running about 60 miles a week, and his goals as far as uh, nutrition were to maintain his 3 to 4% body fat, optimize his performance, and to maintain strength. So why did we do this? Why did we choose this kind of unique case to look over and investigate for three days? Uh, the first and probably most obvious point is that vegan and plant-based diets are rare, and they're particularly rare in college, uh, collegiate athletes. Uh, so that, that was kind of the first uh, point of reference that we looked at. Also, high-level endurance athletes often suffer from a calorie deficit. Uh, on any given day now, I burn 4,500 to 5,500 calories, that's a lot to take in. And so eating uh, fruits and vegetables and whole grains, they aren't very calorie dense. So um, it's a little harder for me to get my calories. I have to be a little more conscious about it. And that is the reason that this isn't a prevalent diet among many endurance athletes. Uh, so some common questions. 
is it possible for a vegan diet to sufficiently fuel a collegiate athlete? That's one thing we wanted to address and look at. And then also, what about protein? It's kind of the elephant in the room. Uh, a package is 27% more likely to be picked up at the grocery store if it has the word protein on it. And so that's something uh, culturally that we wanted to address and see how true it was. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is during this case study, I was new to the vegan diet. I had, I think, done it for two to three months. And so that's something to keep in mind and something we wanted to take a look at. All right, so here's day one of our three-day uh, food analysis. Uh, as you can see, it's been broken up into calories consumed and calories burned. Up top, you see during the uh, course of a day, Jackson consumed 2,917 kilocalories, and he burned 3,448, which puts him in a calorie deficit of 531 calories. So uh, calorie deficit, if that's maintained, uh, Jackson would be losing weight. So that's uh, one thing we're looking at. And during this day, he was deficient in fluoride, vitamin D, choline, chromium, biotin, iodine, molybdenum, uh, chloride, and had he consumed 96 ounces of water. And over here you can see uh, his breakdown of the food groups. Uh, we have 175% of his total daily value of whole grains were consumed, 320% uh, of his daily value of vegetables, 160% of his daily value of whole fruits, of course no dairy, and 142% of his daily value of proteins. And this next slide is a look at what one day of uh, food looked like for Jackson. And we have highlighted, up top we have the sublingual B12 complex. So that's a uh, supplement he's taking for vitamin B12 since uh, you can't gain B12 off a vegan diet. Um, also down here we have uh, other supplements. Uh, the ferrous sulfate is iron and uh, the emergency packet has vitamin C to help uh, better absorb the ferrous sulfate. And also, uh, we have large carrot highlighted over there. And uh, we'll get to that later in the presentation as to why his vitamin A uh, might be so high during this analysis. Yeah, we don't want to spend too much time on, on those details, but they're important to highlight so that we can understand later maybe why my vitamin A content was so high. Uh, so looking at day two, I consumed 3,462 kilocalories. Uh, whereas I burned 3,959 kilocalories, I again had about a similar calorie deficit of around 500. Uh, I was deficient in the same smattering of nutrients uh, with the addition of sodium. Um, that's something not a lot of people are deficient in, but it's something that I have a problem with when I'm not eating processed foods. So we'll address that later as well. As you can see the food uh, group breakdown, I again was not deficient in anything. And as far as the protein myth, you can see that I got 308% of my daily value of protein. So, and on this next slide, you can see that uh, a lot of that might have come from the Brazil nuts, cashews, peanut butter, sunflower seeds, uh, so on and so forth. All right, day three. This day was his largest deficit. As you can see, 1,098 kilocalorie deficit, meaning he burned about 1,100 calories more than he consumed. So that's not exactly what you want if he's looking to maintain uh, his body composition. And again, uh, you'll see he's deficient in about the same micronutrients. Uh, this time with the addition of fat, uh, he all didn't reach his 100% daily value of fat, only reached 64%. And then over here again, you see he is met all his uh, food group daily value requirements. And we'll take a look at the consumption. Again, his supplements are highlighted, as well as the sweet potato, again, for vitamin A reasons, which we'll get to. All right, so now to the fun stuff, looking at those three days overall. We have uh, the micronutrients that I did not meet my daily values in. Uh, these are averages over the three days. 
So first we have sodium. Uh, as we addressed that earlier, I did not get enough sodium one of those days. The simple solution to this is just to add a little bit more sea salt. Maybe when I'm making guacamole or uh, anything of that sort, it's not really too big of an issue, but it is super important for proper muscle function, and I lose a lot of sodium uh, due to sweat, especially on two plus hour runs. So uh, it's something I need to pay attention to and I've addressed recently. Vitamin D, I only got 27% of my daily value. This is kind of a funny nutrient. It's been argued whether this should be a hormone or a vitamin due to the fact that when, ex uh, when our skin is exposed to sunlight, our skin, uh, there's a chemical reaction that goes on that helps to generate vitamin D within our bodies. Therefore, we don't need 100% of it through our diets. It may just help the process along. These nutrients down here, uh, fluoride, choline, chromium, biotin, iodine, molybdenum, and chloride, as you can see, there's kind of various, you know, uh, ranging from 48% of my daily value down to 0%. I didn't get these according to my plate super tracker. However, when we looked up the nutritional facts of many of the foods that I ate, I exceeded my daily value in these. So anytime that you're dealing with technology or any kind of system that you're punching numbers into, you're probably going to run into some problems, and that's what happened with these guys down here. So the micronutrients I got too much of. I got way too much vitamin B12. As you can see, I was supplementing with that every day. 2,136% of my daily value. Obviously, that's overkill. How I address that? I only do it about once a week now. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a dropper, and it, and it goes under my tongue. It's a sublingual supplement. Uh, this is the only nutrient that cannot be obtained through plants. So it's very important that I get this, however, uh, since it comes in such large doses, I don't need to take it as often. The vitamin A, this came from the sweet potatoes and carrots that I ate. Uh, this is not something to worry about as you're not going to eat a sweet potato every day or a carrot every day, uh, hopefully. Um, but uh, something to address and selenium came from the amount of Brazil nuts that I had. I think I had a half a cup of Brazil nuts one day. So. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Jackson's micronutrient overview. So for the three days, he averaged a uh, 709 kilocalorie deficit, uh, which means he was burning more than he was consuming. And uh, when we look at protein, he averaged 1.3 uh, grams per kilogram of body weight. And for uh, he sh should want to be around 1.6 to 2 grams per kilogram body weight especially as an endurance athlete. Jackson would want to be more toward the higher range, near that two, uh, just to repair uh, his muscle breakdown. And uh, also looking at carbohydrates, uh, Jackson averaged 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight, and he wants to be around six to 10. And again, for endurance athletes, uh, he's since he uses most carb, carbs for his, uh, to fuel his running, he's going to want to be toward the higher end of that. And when you look at fats, he was at 39% of his total calories were from fats, and he wants to be around 20 to 35, but it's not a huge problem considering uh, we get that calorie deficit up by him uh, consuming more calories total and incre by increasing protein and carbohydrate intakes that percent of fats is going to go down, so hopefully within that range. And also, a uh, good thing to think about when considering his fat intake is he can, consumes no saturated fats, so all the healthy fats. All right, uh, from then to now. So on March uh, 16th, we did a, another look at his diet just to see how he had changed his diet after the three-day case study. And uh, looking at it now, he, we found no deficiencies or excess intakes. Uh, Jackson's back up to running 115 miles a week after uh, injury he suffered during, right before the first case study. Uh, he has maintained his vegan diet and continues to prove athletically. And he's maintained all three of those goals he listed in the earlier slides of uh, optimizing performance, uh, 
keeping uh, body weight between 3 and 4 percent, and uh, improving athletically. So you can also see he's good in all his uh, food groups, especially in vegetables, 526 percent. All right, so uh, now the question to look at is, why did I do this? What's, what was my rationale? What was my reasoning? A lot of these reasons are controversial, and, and this is kind of the reason that the B word gets a bad rap. Uh, and, I, and I would rather use plant-based than vegan. Uh, vegan has, I don't know if you've ever heard the joke, uh, how do you know if someone's vegan? Don't worry, they'll tell you all about it. Uh, that's kind of true right now, but uh, just bear with me. So the first thing is nutritional density. As a whole foods vegan, almost everything I eat is unprocessed, and it's a raw fruit, vegetable, or whole grain. Uh, because of this, uh, the, the foods that I'm eating are extremely nutritionally dense. You can see down here the models of the stomachs. 400 calories of oil, what that looks like. 400 calories of chicken, what that looks like. And then 400 calories of vegetables. So not only am I filling up my, so not only do I get to eat all the time, because my stomach's always full and then, and then I'm hungry again and my stomach's always full and I'm hungry again, but the, when my stomach is full, it's full of nutrients. The standard American diet is only 6% uh, fruits and vegetables. So what I'm doing as an athlete is I'm maximizing my potential to restore and recover. Vibrance, uh, it's kind of a funny word, but what I'm really talking about are the enzymes that come with food. Now, they're, uh, in raw foods, there are enzymes that help to digest your food once you ingest it. What happens when we cook these foods is that those enzymes die and our bodies need to do all the work as far as digestion and assimilation go. So by uh, keeping these enzymes in the raw foods that I eat, uh, my body's doing less work and I can put more of it towards recovery. Uh, so we kind of covered easy assimilation and digestion. Alkalinity is a huge thing. Today, the standard American diet is very acidic. Uh, animal proteins uh, are very acidic when they enter our bloodstream, and our body has to do quite a bit of work, and in some cases has to pull minerals out of our bones to neutralize that acidity. So by creating alkalinity in my diet, I'm decreasing my inflammation, and as we all know, inflammation impedes recovery. So that's one big thing. And environmentally, we, we have some reasons as well. As you can see, this graphic over here, which I find particularly helpful, you can see what one pound of soy looks like compared to one pound of meat. Uh, we use 12 times the amount of land to produce one pound of meat as we do soy. We use 13 times the amount of oil to produce uh, meat as compared to soy. And we use 15 times the amount of water to produce one pound of meat when compared to one pound of soy. Now obviously you're not going to eat soy all day, but with any amount of uh, plants, we'll find that these values are lower and that the nutritional content in most cases is going to be higher. So uh, kind of another thing to look at here is one sixth of an acre per year is all that's needed to feed someone on a vegan diet, whereas three acres per year is what's needed to feed someone on a non-vegan diet. So that's 18 times as much land that's needed. Um, and 90% of Western disease can be cured or reversed uh, through dietary and lifestyle changes. And while right now I don't have to worry about that too much, I'm training at a very high volume, at some point that's going to stop. And to have these habits going forward uh, is something that's really important to me to prevent things like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, uh, kind of the leading causes of death and suffering in America. So kind of looking at the last thing, we, we, we kind of covered these. Uh, vegan misconceptions, it's just weird. What I would argue is that, you know, our, our view of health in America is what's weird. Uh, and so maybe we need to change that a little bit. It's not weird, it's just different. There's nothing to eat. As you can see, I've adjusted my calorie content. Strong bones and calcium. Uh, my calcium was never deficient. In fact, it was often twice as much as I needed. Uh, it costs too much. You kind of want to compare the uh, protein or the uh, the cost of vegetables compared to the cost of meat. You can see what I'm talking about. And as far as protein, the hippo, the elephant, and the rhino are three of the biggest animals in the 
uh, in the animal kingdom, and no one seems to ask where they get their protein, and they're completely plant-powered, and that's just one fun thought to leave you with. Thank you very much. Thank you.